All right, well, welcome everyone to this next episode of 30 Minutes with a Hacker. This is Jade Witte, and I'm excited to be here with uh, Stan Rabin and Declan Fay from uh, Kino Cozy out of the Chicago area, as well as they've got offices in the DC area, and we'll, we will get a chance to hear from them in just a second, kind of give their overview. But I wanted to just take a minute because on these calls, we've been doing this for a year and a half and we do this podcast, but we've got quite a team at Tech Data and it's really helpful to kind of understand the, the hackers that we have. They're ethical hackers, you know, engineers, and they've been doing this for many, many years. So we have Brett Scott, Josh Hart, John Garner, Josh Hickok, and Dylan Hudson. Um, these are all engineers that um, have just decades of experience um, in the ethical hacking and penetration testing, vulnerability assessments, um, as well as from a defensive perspective, um, managing and running SOCs for large corporations. So these guys, um, they'll actually are called in from uh, time to time and they do work with our government and military. So they, these guys are in the real trenches securing our country and, and helping um, on a regular basis. So they're definitely in the know. And so um, we started this call, you know, a year and a half ago, really just to pick their brain because it's, it's, uh, we get a lot of great insights from them and they're willing to share. And so um, we recently in January started having partners on that have a strong security practice where we could uh, have them on as a guest. And so that's why we're real excited to have Kino Cozy on. So I'm going to kick it over to uh, Declan to maybe give a little bit, uh, a quick overview of Kino Cozy. Thanks, Jade. Uh, yeah, so Kino Cozy, uh, at Kino Cozy, we're a technology consulting firm, um, about 30, 30 ish plus years of experience, primarily in the legal vertical. Uh, we offer white glove, onshore help desk operation, full service engineering uh, team, and a 24 by 7 managed service practice. Um, I mean, you name it, we, we really do it for, uh, for our clients. That's great. Well, we're glad to have you guys. And uh, the topic that we have today is uh, something that is a little bit of a follow on to last month's call, but it's just something that is uh, so important right now as uh, people are working remote. And that is how to secure the home, specifically the C-suite security at the home. And we're learning a lot about how the hacking community is kind of exploiting different vulnerabilities. So we wanna dive into this topic a little further um, to kick this off, though, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let Stan Rabin share, because I know when, when COVID hit, uh, your company was absolutely barraged with your customers, and, uh, and you were scrambling. I want you just to share a little bit um, what you guys were faced with and kind of what you've been dealing with ever since. Yeah, thanks, Jade. So when COVID hit, although a lot of firms were anticipating a shutdown of the downtown Chicago area, no one was really preparing properly for it because no one knew what to expect. But when the governor issued um, his decree that no one come down to the downtown area, we were really hit with a barrage of literally hundreds, if not you know, over a thousand requests for users now to be able to operate remotely from their home. And we were faced with several challenges um, in this respect. The first one was, you know, do the clients even have the capability to operate remotely? And then secondarily, what hardware are they going to have at home? Is it going to be a, a firm resource, uh, something new that they ran out to purchase, or a home computer that their kid had been using? So we had to take all of these factors into consideration figure out what would work best for each um, firm, each client. And then within each client, we had to determine what do we need to do to secure that remote user's connection? Um, you know, because now we're really just extending their network to the to, out into their home networks, anything their kid or their neighbor potentially was doing. Uh, we didn't want that kind of reflecting back onto the network. So, you know, we had a couple internal meetings and worked with our managed services department and really came up with um, like a suite of products and solutions that we found would be best suited to ensure that our clients 
if they wanted to, would adopt and uh, work in what we felt is the most secure environment possible for them. Would, would you be willing to walk us through what some of those uh, products were that you included in your um, kind of get secure suite for working from home? Yeah, sure. So um, there were, there were certain, numerous concerns. Number one, um, if it was a firm resource, so a, comp a firm owned laptop, those things were already very well protected with um, typically, you know, antivirus, VPN, in some cases with uh, Cisco um, umbrella. Um, and they were usually up to date with Microsoft patches and they certainly were not Windows 7 or below uh, machines. So our concerns were with new machines and machines that the clients already had at home, how do we ensure that these machines are stable and, and uncompromised before we allow those machines onto the network? So um, working again with managed services and Declan led a lot of this, um, we, we came up with several plans. Number one, which um, generated an enormous amount of work for us and at some point even you know, it flooded us, was that we determined we would not let any home machine onto the network unless we had vetted it first. So you know, we, through our remote control tools, we would look at every home machine, make sure that it was Windows 10 or above, um, make sure it was fully patched and had antivirus. Those were the, the minimum requirements to get onto the network. So, so did you have did you have instances where people were trying to connect um, from their personal devices to a production network, uh, like the example you gave, or were you just shoring up the line of defense to make sure it didn't happen? Well, shoring up the line of defense. You know, we wouldn't give them access to the VPN or any of the remote capabilities until we had vetted their machine. So they did sort of, did sort of like an assessment on their on their machine. Correct. Make sure, running, make sure they were running required software, et cetera, et cetera. I'm sorry, this is Daniel. I came in a little bit late. I apologize. Yeah, no, not a problem. But yes, that's exactly it. So can you give us an idea of how well prepared folks were? Like what percentage of people working from home were ready to go versus how many you had to kind of coach to get them up to speed? Declan, I mean, it's probably about a 50-50 split um with our clients some of them because they were accustomed to working from the home or on the road you know had citrix farms or rds farms or even virtual desktops um, that they would connect to so if they were in those environments typically their endpoint was well protected and we maybe just had to beef up the the internal resources um, so that they could handle now a full load of users working remotely. That's awesome. Um, yeah, I know a lot of uh, folks were caught flat and uh, are now trying to urgently upgrade their perimeter and upgrade their network capacity. And of course, uh, many were uh, not prepared to monitor, not in building assets. So uh, that's great news that uh, you had already coached your team to be versatile enough and agile enough to deal with this kind of disruption. So that's uh, good on you for that. Yeah, and I think it goes to a lot of the way we operate internally. We have, um, we work with some of the largest law firms in the world. And um, as such, we have SLAs that we have to live up to. So in, you know, modeling our, our environment, that's what we kind of wanted to mirror with a lot of our clients. Um, you know, I, I, uh, I'm kind of the conduit for a lot of the funding <laughs> and it's, you know, it's a typical story. It's like, uh, why are we spending all this money? Um, but, you know, it's certainly proven uh, a, to be a very, very good investment and very worth well, very well worthwhile building up the environment for a scenario like this, which uh, quite honestly, I'm sure everyone hoped would never happen. Well, I'll ask you, uh, but I, I'm, the next question I want to ask you is related to, you know, did the C-suite specifically give you any complications 
But prior to that, I want to ask um, things about duration. So are you hearing from your customer base their intention to maintain or sustain work from home for some time longer than they originally anticipated? Um, there's no formal plans, but what we have been hearing is that, hey, this is working so well, why do we even need to go back to the office? So I'm sure as leases become due or you have to start nego renegotiating that a lot of people will be thinking about da downsizing because they've seen how well they can operate in a remote environment like this. So this really does represent a significant shift in the normal footprint. So there's a, uh, a large transition of the operational space for the entire customer base out there. And that's an awful lot of change. So uh, that brings with it a whole series of challenges. And I know that this call is focusing on the C-suite. So um, could you share with us maybe some of the unusual or uh, common challenges you have in dealing with the C-suite and a work from home situation? You know, the biggest challenge we had with the C-suite and, and, you know, no offense to them, but is because they're typically the, an, the older generation within a firm, they were somewhat resistant to the security protocols being put into place. Um, you know, some attorneys haven't changed their password in, in years. Um, some people don't want complex passwords. They don't like two-factor authentication. Why do I have to connect to the VPN before I do this? So everybody wants their, their access and their, their working conditions to be as simple as possible. And that's what we've always tried to balance is, you know, how, how complex is the security going to be before they can actually access their systems? Um, but, you know, for the most part, we've been able to work through it. There, there may be one or two exceptions but typically it's been a very smooth operation. And one thing, especially once the C-suite realizes what's at risk. Yeah, that's fantastic. So Declan, so what would be your tips? So if you, if you're, if you have uh, encounter an organization that is making do with what they have, but they realize it's not optimal, what would be your prescription, if you will, for the, the, the end things you should do to make this a sustainable practice for businesses going forward? Sure. Uh, so I think Stan said it pretty well. Um, people generally tend to dislike change. Um, so one of the things that we kept in mind when we were kind of road mapping this all in the early stages of the state home orders um, was to choose products and solutions um, that would keep the changes as small as possible. You know. Um, we want users to be secure. We don't want them to be jumping over all these hurdles um, because at the end of the day, you know, they just want, they, they need to work, you know? Um, so as far as specific solutions, um, the number one thing that we would recommend have been recommending is um, some kind of additional factor of MFA to FA, um, like a duo or um, Microsoft MFA. Um, regular review of perimeter external facing devices, make sure those are patched, uh, make sure there's nothing left open, uh, regular review of any kind of administrative accounts, um, and then some kind of solution in place to keep an eye on, you know, the logs coming in from all those said perimeter external devices to make sure that um, all of our work is not for nothing, you know, that no one's going to be able to actually get in. So do you guys help uh, organizations with technical assessments to kind of find out where they are and then uh, give them a plan for how they get to where they need to be? We do, yeah. That's actually um, something that I'm involved with pretty heavily. Um, during the initial, initial client onboarding, uh, when we take out a new customer, um, we do a full review of uh, from security standpoint um, and make recommendations based off of that. Um, so that the client is coming in, you know, as secure as possible. Now, are you seeing, you know, you, you're, you're hearing a lot of chatter out there about uh, bad guys targeting people at home and things like that. Are any kind of regular attacks or things that people who have not yet experienced these types of attacks that you want to give them a heads up about? I don't think we're seeing a ton of um, stuff outside the normal, um, you know, the, 
the, the fake invoice attacks, for example, um, I need you to wire transfer seventy thousand um, dollars. But we have seen a few. Yeah, it definitely seems like now that people are settling into uh, you know the new life, it's it's going to become a more significant problem. Yeah. So John, I think Josh, if um, Daniel, I'm so, yeah, sorry, Brett. Uh, you know, if anywhere there's been an increase in um, in in malicious email attacks, but it hasn't landed up at our client on our clients' desktops. Thank goodness. Um, you know that the 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 spam filtering and security tools that we've been using seem to catch a lot of that. We're seeing a huge uptick in that. Um, but as a result of that, we have increased our awareness training for our clients. So, you know, we do t uh, phishing attacks, scheduled phishing attacks, and then report back to our clients just, you know, what potentially they missed and how they can better educate their end users um, on what to look for. Absolutely. So, John, Josh, Daniel, uh, and uh, that's both Josh's. Sorry, Mr. Hickok. So uh, is there anything you want to add to that picture as far as repositioning your defenses when people are no longer sitting inside of a physical building and you now have to secure a multi-enterprise situation? Yeah, so <clears throat> one question that I have for people who are kind of fighting the good fight out there is what's your feeling on um, the spread of shadow IT and BYOD and people who in order to be or maintain the same level of productivity are kind of um, sneaking around maybe some of the risk controls that you had. Are you running into that? I don't know because we haven't heard a lot about it yet. You know, well, from our clients, we haven't had reports of any of those instances. Um, I guess that's as much as I can say. Just we... We haven't heard any, we've had no reports of it, so I don't see a big uptick. But again, that goes back to kind of what I was saying about um, choosing solutions that keep it as simple as possible and um, don't stray too much from the user's normal day-to-day -day, uh, login, you know, workload, workflow, that kind of thing. Uh, when, you're, when you're deploying stuff at clients, it's important to, to kind of keep that in mind so that users aren't trying to circumvent whatever processes, procedures, lockdown you're putting in place. Yeah, I think maintaining a usability factor is the win here, right? Like we've always talked about the triangle of usability, security, and privacy. And when you, when you go strongly towards one, uh, two, two of the others tend to suffer. And so you try to get into a middle of being able to be secure and having things be usable. And so the practical basic steps of changing default passwords, using something unique and strong, may, ensuring that systems connecting to the, the environment are, are, are patched and up to date. Um, I think something that should be taken in consideration as well is what type of home routers uh, are you using in devices uh, along the way? Um, you know, that could be a bit, bit of what we could be considered a pro user step a user who has more sophistication and ability uh, to deploy these technologies at home, um, but is also a, an item to take into consideration. I, I mean, it's refreshing to hear that a lot of the basic stuff we talked about in our last work from home conversation and what we've tried to talk about and getting back to basis, basics and ensuring users maintain a level of security with usability. Uh, you know, what you guys have done with trying to get people out, off of credential reuse and complex passwords and using multi-factor authentication or two-factor authentication is going to be one of those areas that is an easy win. You know, it, yes, it's a hard conversation to have. And yes, it's difficult to maybe remember what you've changed. Um, but it is a way in which you ensure your own success. And now something I'm curious about is if at these firms uh, they have uh, security, like a security admin or a CISO, or if they're leveraging you guys uh, for that security uh, space and, and field? So our clients are divided up into a couple different categories or sizes. So 
our SMB clients would rely on us to be their CISO and advise them on all security matters. Some of the larger clients, they have an internal CISO or a formal arrangement with a third party that acts as their CISO. Um, so it really varies depending on the size of the client and, and their internal resources. But typically, the larger ones do it on their own. The smaller ones rely on us. And what have you seen as their adaptability? Has there been new things that maybe are keeping those CISOs up at night that weren't keeping them up before? Um, have you seen some ways in which they're uh, strongly championing what it is you guys are consulting them to do? What has been their reaction uh, to this? Um, I don't want to sound, uh, what's the word? Can't think of the right word here, but um, you know, I don't want to sound cocky, but our clients have been very, very appreciative of everything we've done over the last eight to 10 weeks in, in getting them to the point that they're at. And I think they really looking at us now, although we were always a trusted advise the advisor, but they really coming to us and say, okay, you know, thank you for getting us to point A. Now, what else do you suggest? What else do we need to be concerned with? How can we make this environment better and more stable? And because we've always been kind of leading with this, with the security concern, they're also becoming more con con security conscious and asking us what more they could be doing from a security point standpoint of view. So are you, are you seeing budgets open up then, like past budgets and past uh, uh, initiatives that may have been put on the back burner because they couldn't get to them or they didn't have the funding for it before or the dollars weren't being allocated now that you see those projects moving forward? And maybe if, if so, and that's the thing you're, you're seeing, maybe talk about roadmaps and planning that you're doing with these customers for a bit of insight of those listening um, as to maybe practical steps they can take as well to either get approved or to move mm -hmm. forward uh, into implementing a goal or a project as they work from home. Uh, budgets and projects have been reprioritized um, and certainly prioritizing security and obviously remote access. As far as um, roadmaps and things we're discussing with our clients, um, it's really the cloud and why moving everything to the cloud now is a lot more beneficial than having it back in the office. Um, you know, as far as accessibility and security and I think a lot of the, the tools that are out there to facilitate easier connectivity to the cloud or sec and secure connectivity to the cloud than back to a, a home office. Um, right, right when Corona hit, we had a, well, I was working on a project with a client helping them select new office space because their lease is coming up. And, um, you know, after working from home for a month, the client came to me and said, you know, what do we need to do to put everything in the cloud? I'm now thinking of not even taking office space. We can just have everyone work from home. So, so what, you know, it, having everything in the cloud negates the, the need for a server room or IT room. Yeah. And then you why, why even need office space if, if your workload can be accommodated remotely. So the, ne stuff. the next one is like a personal question. Are you guys feeling the ability to scale for that? Like, are you, are you ready to see people move into this space and help them execute? How, how are your feelings towards that, right? Well, I'm just going to have Declan do everything, so it's not my problem. <laughs> Declan, what you say? Yeah, I think um, I think we're absolutely ready for it. Um, that, you know, before uh, COVID-19 hit, that was kind of um, one of the uh, things at the top of the list for us um, was cloud migrations, um, working with our clients to kind of figure out what they need to get them there and then um, getting it done. I think we had done... I, I mean, at least a half a dozen um, before all this started. So we are definitely ready, yeah. 
So yeah. one of the next shifts that's going to happen is as the, the stay at home orders start relieving and people are not going back to an office because for whatever reason, like they may not have renewed their lease, et cetera, it seems like uh, you have another layer of communication because if they're no longer working from a home where you've ascertained the security with their working, say, in a Starbucks again or things like that, that might create another a series of deltas for you. And I'm curious to see if you have any strategies for that as an additional uh, layer of complexity. I think um, the solutions that we kind of package and offer to our clients um, work in such a way that it won't really matter where they're working from, whether that be uh, home, Starbucks, or uh, any, really anywhere outside the office, um, just because we are kind of keeping a focus on the, the main points that Stan mentioned earlier, you know, keeping uh, antivirus installed and up to date, uh, keeping the OS patched, making sure, um, you know, it's current, and um, making sure the user has a solid resource in, you know, our help desk to reach out to should they have questions, problems, or something, you know, that they deem strange come up. Well, and, and congratulations to you guys. I mean, security is so much easier when you're proactive and you have people that are, have a high competency in this craft. Uh, because I, I do believe that your customers are experiencing a level of lower disruption as a direct result of your preparedness and your ability to suit the your customer base. So congratulations to you guys for doing a great job there. I'm confident that that's not the, the story for most. So uh, keep, keep up the good work on that front. Um, Thank you. John, do you have any thoughts or anything else you'd like to add to this? Some of those uh, topic points we got out there on the table? I mean, in all honesty, you, know, you kind of hit the nail on the head on the last part. Kudos, uh, uh, kudos to Stan and Declan for, uh, from 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 all the other people I've talked to, from everything I've read in articles, like you guys are legitimately like the standard bearer in how to do this right. Um, and if, if everybody uh, could emulate you guys, we, we'd all be in a much better place. Well, thank you. That's nice to hear. Um, we have taken care just in this package that we've put together that everything is really managed through the cloud. Uh, is one thing I wanted to add. So it really doesn't matter where the machine is, as long as it has an internet connection, you know, we can monitor and update and manage and do whatever we need to do to a remote machine to ensure that it's, you know, that it met the requirements when we brought it on and that it continues to stay um, in line with what we need. As we're, as we're, kind of getting close to wrapping this up. This has been great dialogue and awesome hearing what you guys are dealing with, with Kino Cozy. Um, anything that uh, from the, from the tech data team that you guys are seeing out there that's making you um, concerned, some things that we're not looking at um, that, that people aren't really taking note of that the hacker community is, uh, is uh, trying to exploit that maybe a heads up on what you're seeing. Well, certainly the legal profession is being highly targeted. And so you're starting to see uh, trade press articles covering this topic. You know, uh, legal has always been a very significant high value target to the bad guys. So there's so much wealth that can be generated from what can be stolen from the attorneys. Uh, so that has simply gone to st on steroids because of the fact that uh, as people are further separated from each other, communication could potentially be not as robust as it was before, and therefore there are greater susceptibilities. Uh, it was mentioned earlier in the call that we have of these things called the business email compromise scam, which is, hey, please wire 70 grand for this urgent thing I've been working on, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, if, you, if you attend an FBI briefing, they're gonna tell you that's the number one theft that's going on out there. Quite literally, a massive number of victims uh, are being hit by exactly those types of scams. And I'm sure that gets worse uh, when you have everybody working from home. So the C-suite uh, is particularly vulnerable because of the fact that a lot of companies in the C-suite are based on uh, knowing your team, knowing how they work, and assuming that things are gonna move the way you thought they did. Well, if someone's able to jump in the middle of that and assume the identity of one of your other teammates, uh, that can create an awful lot of damage quickly, and it's very difficult to recover from. So uh, that is absolutely a, a major encounter zone. That's something that in our ISAO, 
information sharing analysis organization for people who don't really have an acronym that it, we are seeing and it is very common and of course we work um, and, and work very closely with other folks and when we get briefed by the FBI and they tell us what's going on that's always the first thing that they mention is you know we're, we're being robbed blind uh, through these little scams and, uh, mm -hmm. and it's very hard for the Secret Service to recover the money so uh, yeah, that's absolutely one of the big deals. Uh, Josh, John, you have anything else, or Josh Hickok, you have anything else to add as far as things you're seeing? I think to round it out, if we can just reiterate maybe, because um, we talked about it earlier, uh, we're getting to the end of the call. There's been a lot of information talked about. Uh, Declan and Stan, or Declan or Stan, whichever you want to take it, outline um, the top solutions or technologies that you would recommend uh, one either evaluate or implement uh, to ensure security while working from home. Declan, you want to take that? Do you want? Yeah. Um, oh. So first and foremost, like we mentioned earlier, would be um, the two FA offering. Um, we are partners uh, with Microsoft in their in, and we offer their um, MFA solution as well as Duo. Um, we've had great success with both. Um, Second isn't really a solution as more a product as more as more of um, just something to keep in mind. It would be um, like I said, shoring up your perimeter. Um, I think we're at six or seven now major vulnerabilities um, that we've come across in the last few months um, that we've been scrambling to get our clients updated. Um, whether it be uh, Exchange, uh, Microsoft RDS, um, things like that. So reviewing um, what's you know external facing. Um, as well as administrative accounts, um, making sure that, uh, like we've been talking about C-suites especially, um, as they're kind of a, a high value target, um, make sure they are, we are expiring passwords for them, make sure that password complexity is there, make sure the user awareness training is put in place so that they know how to react when they see those, uh, you know, the fake PDF invoices for $70,000 um, from accounting and things like that. Um, those would be my three big things. Yeah, and maybe to add on, um, Umbrella, Cisco Umbrella is a great tool we like to deploy, um, especially to remote machines, that way we can centrally configure policies, usage policies for machines. Um, it, taking full advantage of some of the tools built into Umbrella and Intune, you know, to ensure that machines are up to date that they have antivirus, things like that, before allowing any network access. And then we do like just a small um, management tool um, called Automox. Um, you know, this allows us just to get a very easy view, holistic view of all the machines that are out there and their patch levels and where they are. Um, you know, we all, we all know the, the, the saying, security is no longer set and forget. So, you know, while we may review a machine before we let it on the network, uh, that's a point in time. We need to make sure that it remains compliant through the duration of, of its connectivity life. And so just using the right tools to make sure we stay um, in compliance is very important. All right. Well, thank you so much. Um, we need to wrap this up. We're at the 30 minute mark and uh, this was super helpful. Stan and Declan, thank you so much for being on the call. Um, 30 years in business as Kino Cozy. That's uh, quite an accomplishment. And uh, with that, there's a lot of uh, just great real world experience that you guys have and your company has been dealing with. So uh, congratulations again on the on the success that you guys are having. And thank you for being on this call. And uh, with that, we'll wrap it up and look forward to next month's call on 30 Minutes with a Hacker.